Hi, I'm Dave, one of the teaching pastors, and it is great to be here with you today. And if you're a guest, we're so glad that you're here with us today. We really are. Uh, I, I want to also say that this is one of our fun kind of standalone messages where we're going to talk about baptism. We're going to look at the meaning of baptism and, and all that that entails. And so I'm really excited about this. And, and we're going to going to help you understand that the baptism is this kind of symbol that you raise to a new life. And so let's talk about this. I want to begin by telling you what happened to me a few years ago. Um, and, and it was really kind of a fun experience. I had been asked to go over to Europe to do some teaching and to do some mentoring for some countries. And so we went to this one country and they showed us one of the oldest baptistries in the world. It was really cool in this missionary says that this was like around the third century, I think, something like that. It was really old. But then he said this, and it really caught my attention. He said, back in those days, if you publicly got baptized, he said, in those days, you would put your life on the line because the authorities were against Christianity. And so if you got baptized, you literally could be thrown in prison or you could be killed. And I thought, wow, the courage those people had to be willing to get baptized in public. Because here's how it works. Faith, in a sense, is a private thing, but baptism is a very public thing. And, and we've been doing baptisms for a couple thousand years now. As a matter of fact, there's all kinds of ways to get baptized. So you can get baptized in a pool, you can get baptized in the ocean, you can get baptized in a river, right? You can get baptized in a lake. I remember about 20 years ago, we're going to do a work project at our Huntington campus. And he said, Dave, come and help me. We got to go pick up a baptistry. So he gets this truck and I'm thinking, well, this truck doesn't look that big to, to, to carry a baptistry. And so we go to this shop and, and all of a sudden he brings out a horse trough for water. And I said, Carl, where are we going to put the baptistry? He says, you don't get it. This is it. I said, we're baptizing horses? He said, no, we, we, this is where we put people. And I said, okay. And I, that was like one of the coolest things i ever seen in my life. You literally dip them in the horse trough and bring them out. I go, do they go, ah, when they get done? I mean, okay, I had to try it. We're, we're, you laughed and ducked your head, and you felt bad for me, didn't you? So there's all kinds of ways. Here's one really cool thing today. At, at our Brigham City campus, they are baptizing eight people literally about probably right now, right? And they're doing it in the Great Salt Lake. You don't stay under the water long there. Yeah, yeah. And so we're going to talk about baptism, but I want to begin with kind of giving you a definition. Baptism is this outward, right, symbol of an inward reality. And the inward reality is I know Jesus loves me. I know he went to the cross. I know he paid for all of my sins, my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins. And I know because he paid for them, I made right with God. And that's, you know, step one and going full circle with God, that we get made right with God by trusting in Jesus and the work that he did. And as Jesus rose from the grave, uh, one day all raise from the grave. So baptism is this, yes, Jesus, I agree with you. I love you. I recognize that you did that for me. All right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about baptism. Well, the Apostle Paul is concerned about this early church in Rome. Now, Paul had not been to Rome yet. But he's concerned for them because th there becomes this kind of attitude where people are saying, well, if Jesus died and paid for all my sins, past, present, and future, so if I'm forgiven, why don't I just sin and then keep sinning so I can just ask God because I know he's going to forgive me, right? So if I know Jesus paid the price for me to go to heaven, that kind of gives me permission to live like hell. And Paul said, no, absolutely not. You would never take advantage of the grace of God that way. You wouldn't do it. And then he talks about, right after that, this idea of baptism. So we're going to look at this. So in Romans 6, 3, 4, he says, or, or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? 
For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So we're going to talk about this a little bit, and I want to share with you three principles of baptism, because I really want you to understand what's going on. So here's the first one. Baptism is practiced by Christians everywhere. I've been to 18 different countries sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus. In all of those countries, they do baptism. See, baptism starts because John the Baptist comes on the scene and he begins baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. Well, John is a contemporary of Jesus, and Jesus says to John, John, you need to baptize me. John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. John knows Jesus has no sin. Jesus doesn't want him to be baptized for a sin, but Jesus wants to model for us the priority of baptism. So Jesus is baptized, and and, and then Jesus says to his early disciples, now that you're my follower, you need to be baptized. And then in Matthew 28, when Jesus leaves, he says, listen, I want you to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there are two things Jesus asks us to do until he comes back. One, which we're going to practice today, is take the Lord's communion, but the other is to get baptized And so we're going to talk about what that means. So a few years ago, my wife and I, we got asked to go to Cuba. And at that time, you couldn't get into Cuba. You weren't allowed, and the United States wouldn't let you leave or wouldn't let you come back. But we were able to go. And so here's what's fascinating. And you can pray for Cuba. The gospel is exploding in Cuba. In Cuba, people are coming to know Jesus right and left. So I go there doing teaching, and they take me to different parts of the country so we can do some baptism. It was a really wonderful experience. We come back, and we get to right, the passport section. They said, how did you get to Cuba, and by whose authority should I let you back into the country? And I'm thinking, I'm not going to get back to my own country. So I brought my wife. She's much cuter. And I said, well, we're together, and we did this, and I thought her good looks would help us. And it did. (laughs) And we had some authority from a very important person in the government, and we got back in. But but baptism's been going on for 2,000 years all over the world. Because Jesus said, we're to do this. Because remember, when I meet Jesus, it's a private thing, but baptism is this public thing that says, I am proud to acknowledge that Jesus is my God, that he's my Lord, that he died on the cross for me. So, so that's how baptism starts. It's this very public thing that's been going on for a long time. All right? Now, secondly, baptism signifies our death and resurrection with Jesus. And I'm going to explain all that that means in just a minute. But I want to show you a, a short video uh, of a couple that goes to this campus. And Sonny and Tara um, got baptized here, but a lot of times when people get baptized, we'll do a little video so they can tell their kind of God story. And so they tell their God story, but this one's really fun because, you know, Pastor Tom is shooting the video, but he doesn't really know how it works, right? Which is okay because I don't know how they work. Um, And so he's going to go get help how it works, so he doesn't think the camera's on. Now, they don't think the camera's on either. So they just start sharing some funny stuff, and we thought, we have got to leave this in their video. All right, you want to see this? All right, this is going to be fun. I got to give her keys back anyway. I'm going to go get her. I'll be right back. Say I killed someone, and... (laughs) I'm actually getting baptized to, you know, relieve my sins of murder. (laughs) But a sin is a sin. It doesn't matter how big. (laughs) Funny. Mm. I think it's funny because I was going to do this so long ago, and I was really waiting for you. Weird. Hmm. So it's really your story. You can tell it. No, you're telling everything. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I shot. I thought he showed me faith until I saw you. Come mm-hmm. to God. Then I'm like, whoa, he can do anything. I was really reluctant to 
give up what I perceived as my control over my life and my future. Um, and slowly, I started to realize that I have no control over anything. And that feeling kind of first makes you spin out of control. And then when you do give it up, you realize that that's actually God working in your life, you know, telling you to let that go. And that feeling of control is so um, stressful and it can really lead to a lot of bad habits. So um, my journey in finding Christ is, is that, is letting go. Yes, I realize that I am a huge sinner and have been for a long time. And I probably always will be, but I'd like to minimize it for sure. So I think that in seeking God and finding Christ and putting them first in my life, um, I'll be able to minimize that and become a better person. And I know that there's a purpose for me. And one of my biggest purposes is to lead our family um, and, to, and to lead our family to Christ. Hmm. With me, I was raised Christian, but we didn't go to church, really. Every once in a while, my dad was a car salesman, so never off on. Sundays was his only day. So, like I believed, but didn't really know what I believed. I am a sinner, for sure, I am. And it's hard because it makes you think, I'm not, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe, like, why would he do this for me? But he did. Like, I know Jesus died for my sins, and I know that we're all going to live on uh, even after this life, and I'm very grateful for that. I am so grateful that Jesus died for all of my sins, and I'm even more grateful that when I'm gone from this earth, I'll live in eternity because of what he's done for me with him. Amen. Can I say that? <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> I think you can speak for both of us. <laughs> I can't talk for her. I've been in trouble for that. <laughs> Isn't that good? Now, if, you, if you're around their age and you need some fun couple friends, that's it right there, right? See, that explains what we're going to talk about right here, Romans 6, 4. So let me take it apart for you. Watch what the Apostle Paul says to the, these early Roman Christians. He says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I didn't live 2,000 years ago. I didn't literally die with Jesus. No, he's talking about, in a sense, spiritually and symbolically, that when Jesus died, what, what, okay, let me explain it in full diatribe, in a sense. Jesus goes to the cross because he loves you. He loves you, and he doesn't want to spend eternity without you. But he knows that your sin and my sin has separated us from God. We're separated from God. And so Jesus has to be crucified. He dies. He's buried, but he raises again. So, so what, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Baptism is this picture. I was spiritually dead because of my transgressions, because of my selfishness, because of my rebellion, right? Because of me. And I was spiritually dead. And so when Jesus died, he dies to take all of my sin, all of my shame, all of my guilt, but he doesn't stay dead. He rises from the grave. He conquers death. He conquers sin in our lives. We are now forgiven. And because he has the power to live a new life, one day when we die, he's going to help us live a new life as well. I mean, that's the best news you'll ever hear in your life. And it's not because we deserve it or can earn it. We don't deserve it. And we certainly cannot earn it. Jesus does it as a gift. It is the gift of God. It's this word grace. And I love the word grace. Grace means undeserved love of God. 
So God says, I'm going to love you. You haven't earned it. You don't deserve it. But I'm going to do it because I love you. I mean, that is absolutely beautiful. And so baptism isn't new. I mean, Alpine, you know, 18 years ago when it started, just didn't invent baptism, right? It's been going on for 2,000 years. Do you know, in, in one translation, John the Baptist literally is called John the Dipper. He's the Dipper. I love that. Hey, Dipper. Hi, Quipper. I don't know, right? Because it's this picture of immersion, Now, I want to show you something else. It's an important principle. Baptism symbolizes it doesn't save. You see, there are some religions that teach that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, but that's a work. And so the Bible doesn't teach you do any works to receive the salvation of God, but it is a symbol of this. So I want to to show you a short video clip, but I, I need to give a little context. George Clooney is with his fellow convicts, right? These are some pretty bad guys. Oh, brother, we're out there if you've seen it. And they just happen upon this baptism, all right? And, and watch what happens. No, Mark, been saved. Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Delver, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. And the preacher said that that sin's been washed away, too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. (laughs) See, they got this idea that there's something magic in the water. All right? There's nothing magic about baptism. And baptism somehow doesn't save you. Baptism is an acknowledgement that God has already done a work in your life. So let me show you a verse so you can believe this. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. The reason we have peace with God is not because we got baptized. We have peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's how it is. It's nothing we have done. I want to be so clear about this. You know, I ask people sometimes, I say, do you know if you're going to heaven? Yes, I'm going to heaven. I said, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because I'm a good person, right? That's what everybody says, I'm a good person. Well, listen, you can't get to heaven by being good. Heaven's reserved for perfect people. So being good, see, it's like this. God's absolutely good, righteous, holy. He's on this side of the Grand Canyon. We're not. We're on this side. And you said to me, well, Dave, I'm a lot gooder than you. And so maybe you can run in your goodness and you make it out 25 feet. And I only make it 19. We're both going down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you might be better than me. I highly doubt it, but you might. And I'll tell you what, my wife's better than me. I know that already because she's in this service. (laughs) But we're still a mile from the other side of God's holiness. See, heaven isn't reserved for good people. It's reserved for forgiven people. And the only work that will get you there is not any good work you do. It's the work Jesus has already done. So in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it, it, it talks about how God's undeserved favor, his grace, not our works, is what makes us right with God. And that is so powerful and that's so important. 
Here's another illustration. There's the thief on the cross, right? Maybe you've heard this. Jesus is on the cross, but next to him are two hardened criminals. They were there for capital punishment. This thief, my hunch, has probably killed someone in a robbery or something. And the thief doesn't get baptized, but Jesus says to him, hey, this day you can be with me in paradise. You see, if baptism, it takes baptism to save you, then that thief has no chance. But Jesus says to that guy, listen, because of the work I'm doing right now, you can be with me. It's not about baptism, it's about Jesus. Baptism is just this sign that Jesus now lives in you and works through you. It's, it's like a wedding, okay? I've, I've performed a lot of weddings, and at some point in the wedding, I say, you know, by what sign are, are you going to celebrate this union together? Usually they, they give the rings, right? And, and so we hold the rings, and you, you say, okay, take this ring and put it on her finger, and say, with this ring, he says, with this ring, I seal my life and love to you. And really, a lot of people think the wedding is sealed right then when the ring's on. But the ring doesn't make you married. The ring is a symbol that you are married. Baptism doesn't make you saved, but it is a symbol that you are saved. It's a symbol that Jesus is the most important person in your life. I remember I was young and I'd met the Lord. And I grew up in a religion where I thought you had to be good and do good. And I went to this camp and they started talking about Knowing Jesus isn't about being good and doing good and getting to heaven isn't about being good and doing good because we're all sinners. And I tell you, that terrified me because I'd spent my first 15 years trying not to sin because I thought if I didn't sin, I would get to heaven. And I remember years later, I was teaching on this and a man came up to me, probably in the 70s, and he said, Dave, I just want to let you know I don't sin anymore. I said, are you telling me you don't sin anymore? He says, yeah, I don't sin anymore. And I'm thinking inside, I didn't say this, well, you are sinning right now because you're lying. <laughs> but that's not a good pastoral thing to say. So I started studying religions at 15 because I just wanted the truth. And here's what I found out. Every religion but Christianity goes like this. Every single one you got to be good or do good to get to heaven. you got to be good or do good to get reincarnated. You started out as a gnat, and if you be good and do good, in the next life you can be a buffalo. <laughs> and if you do good, you can go from a buffalo to a rhino. And that's what we do. God, Paul calls this self-righteousness. God, I'm going to prove to you how good I am. And the Bible says there's nobody good, not even one. So who should get baptized then? See, baptism is only for broken people. Baptism is only for struggling people. You see, if you've lived for a while, you've been broken by life. And if you haven't been, if you're young and you say, well, that hasn't been my experience, then good, be, enjoy it now because one day you are going to be broken. I, I just love to encourage people in the church. <laughs> What'd you learn today? I'm going to be broken. <laughs> See, life breaks us. Your best friend might break you. Your spouse might break you. Your job might break you. You might break you. A disease might break you. A heart condition might break you. Life is going to break us. Your stubbornness, your pride might break you. And in the midst of that brokenness, we've got to learn to call out to God and say, God, I've been trying to run my life. I've been trying to... To, to, to captain the ship, and God, I'm making a disaster of this thing. And you got to humble yourself, and you got to say, I need Jesus, and I need his forgiveness, 
and I need his mercy, and I need his compassion. And for me at 15, when this guy said I was a sinner, I was undone by it, but down deep, I knew it was true. And I was scared, and I didn't know what to do. And so he, the next meeting, he talked more about what I'm talking about, the gospel, that there's a God who loves you. And, and, and listen, here's what I love telling people. Listen, there's only one reason you're here, and that's because God wanted you here. Not just to Alpine today, but I mean in life. God's the creator. And I want you to think about this. God created you to love you. Do you know that God created you for his own good pleasure? God created you because he wants to enjoy you and delight in you. But see, we broke the relationship with God by our stubbornness and our selfishness and our independence But God said, I don't want to stay away from you forever, so I'm going to do something about it. So I'm going to send my only special son, Jesus Christ. So God the Father sends God the Son, and Jesus pays the penalty for all of our crap, all of our junk, all of our shame, all of our remorse. So when I understood that, I just just wept. I just wept because down deep, I knew I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And it transformed my life. And then after that, I said, I was baptized in my religion when I was young, but I didn't even know really what I was doing. So people say to me all the time, Dave, should I get rebaptized? And I said, well, baptism is understanding that you agree and identify with what Jesus did on your behalf. And if you were like two months old, I don't think you even remember For me, I was younger, and it just didn't have that meaning for me. So when I became a Christian, I said, I want to get baptized. And I remember talking to my mom, and she was not happy with my newfound faith. And she got really mad one day, and she said, you're nothing but a Jesus freak. I didn't think it was very funny. And I came up with some lame excuse, well, I know I am, but what are you? I don't know, what do 15-year-olds say? But I realized at that moment, I had to love Jesus more than the approval of my own mother. And so I went and got baptized. She didn't come. That's okay. Because Jesus was there. So you might be like me, and if that's you, but here's what baptism isn't. Baptism isn't rededication. Like I'll have people say, you know what? I know what I was doing when I got baptized, but I I walked away from the Lord, and I want to come back, so I want to get rebaptized. I said, you know what? That's not what baptism is for. You were truly baptized the first time, but if you want to rededicate your life to Christ, that's fine, but you don't need baptism to do it. But let me ask you, First of all, have you come to the place in your life where you finally humbled yourself enough to realize you're broken and you need a Savior? And maybe that's why you're here today, actually. That's not why you originally came, but maybe that's why you're here. You're like me. You need your eyes open and your heart open that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. Or maybe you're here today, and you have known the Lord for a long time, but the truth is, you haven't got baptized. I have this wonderful woman go, hey, I'm 70-something years old. I'm afraid of water. You you know, that's why I'm not getting baptized. I said, listen, I won't hold you under very long. (laughs) See, Jesus doesn't suggest that we get baptized. He commands us to get baptized. And I just want to encourage you, if you're here today and you know Jesus and you love Jesus but you haven't get baptized, listen, on the back of your your, your card there, just say uh, your name, give us a phone number, give us, and say, I want to get baptized. And we will help you in that process. But, But here's how I want to end, and then I'm going to pray. How I want to end this 
is no one will ever love you in this life more than Jesus already loves you. And that was proved by what he did on the cross, that he was crucified, but then he was buried, but he rose again, and he conquered death, and he conquered the power of sin in your life, and he invites you into that experience with him, and that is a truly loving thing. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you went to the cross, not for yourself, but for each one of us. Thank you, Jesus, that you took all of our shame and all of our guilt and all of our failure and regrets, and Jesus, your word tells us you nailed it to the cross with you. And thank you, Jesus, that by your wounds we are healed. So I want to pray for you if maybe today is the very day you ask Jesus to come in and forgive you of your sin. Today's the very day, the defining moment in your life when Jesus becomes real and you surrender to his love. If that's you, just pray to Jesus. Here was my prayer, dear Jesus. I don't know a lot about you, but I do want to know you, and I do want to follow you. So Jesus, teach me what it means to know you and to follow you for the rest of my days. In your name we pray, amen.